something to you. I, I brought this guy a book uh, written by James Dawson. And uh, James Dawson made this statement in his book, Bringing Up Boys. And then if you're raising children, you ought to get the book, Bringing Up Boys, by James Dawson. This is a tremendous, tremendous book. I'm going to read this to you before I go to the Bible. I brought this because I thought it was so important. James Dobson made this statement about elephants. Now this is strange to associate elephants and nature and children, but he said, the elephant is a magnificent creature, highly emotional, surprisingly intelligent. I suppose that's why it's disturbing to see them suffering in their civilization. In a national park, rangers there reported that young bull elephants in that region had become increasingly violent in several certain years, especially to nearby rhinos. An elephant will knock a rhino over and then kneel and gore him to death. That's not typical of an elephant behavior. It's been very difficult to explain. But now game wardens have cracked the code. Apparently, the aggressiveness is a byproduct of a government program to reduce elephant population by killing the older animals. Almost all the young roads, even orphaned when they were calves, depriving them of adult contact. Under the normal circumstances, dominant older males keep the young bulls in line and serve as role models for them. In the absence of the added influence, Juvenile delinquents grow up to terrorize their neighbors. That's an elephant. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I know it's risky, he said, to apply animal behavior to liberally to human behavior, but a parallel is a striking to, submit, to miss. Let me say it one more time. The absence of early supervision and discipline is often catastrophic for teenagers and for elephants. But then he said this, I thought was fascinating. Prisons are populated primarily by men who are abandoned or rejected by their fathers. Study was given a huge green car company decided to go to the prisons. As a special for Mother's Day, they set up a table in a federal prison inviting any inmate who so desired to send a free car to his mother. The lines were so long that they made another trip to the factory to get more cars. Due to the success of the event, they decided to go to the same thing for Father's Day, but this time no one came. Not one prisoner felt need to send a card to his dad. Many had no idea who their fathers were, and the sobering illustration of a dad's importance to his children. Then James Dobson made this other observation, but he said this about a man hiring. A man of a construction firm said he was hiring and firing men. He said he was asked, what do you think when you're hiring an employee, especially a man? And he said, what do you look for? And the man answered and replied this way, I look primarily at the relationship between a man and his father. If he felt loved by his dad and respected his authority, he likely became a good employee. Then he added, I will not hire a man that is in rebellion against his Dad. He said, if he's in rebellion against his dad, I will have difficulty as well. Between a boy and his dad, that relationship sets the tone for so much of what he will become. Powerful, isn't it? Powerful. 13. You'll take your Bibles and invite you over to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. We're going to look at a man's life this morning. That I trust will glean some truth from. Genesis chapter 13, we're going to look at Lot. Genesis chapter 13 and verse number 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had Lot, a flocks, and herds, and tents. The land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. There was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, 
Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdman and thy herdman. For we be brethren. Well, that's a principle, isn't it? Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Verse 10. The Lord lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like in the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east, separated themselves one from another. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Here's my text, here's my title. And pitched his tent for Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceeded them. Father, I lay my hands on the infallible, inspired Word of God. And for the next few moments, I pray, Father, that you help me speak clear and boldly to the men, to the fathers that are sitting in before me now. Please rise up a generation of men that will walk upright and please you. Help us to learn from Lot this hour. Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to preach to you, man, this morning about which way is your lot, is your tent being pitched. We find Lot, we find a man, and I'll tell you, be honest with you, when I read about Lot, when I look at Lot's life, I immediately jump on Lot's shoulders and I begin to pounce him with my conversation. I begin to pounce him with my comments. If you were not for the book of 2 Peter chapter number 2, I believe it is, we would not know Peter, I mean, was Lot was a righteous man. We would not even know that. We would, matter of fact, if I looked at Lot's life and what I'm just reading, I wouldn't even think he's saved. I think he's a lost man. And the book of Peter tells us, 2 Peter tells us, that he had a righteous soul. That means it was vexed. He was righteous in his soul. That means he was a believer. We find Lot, and I find Lot, and I see him, and I look on him, and I say, man, Lot's wicked. Lot's somebody that needs some help. And I look at Lot, and I, I pounce on him with my, with my thoughts and with my ideas. But then I did a study on Lot's life, and God changed my heart about Lot. I did a little study. I want to do a little study with me on, in Lot's life, and I challenge you to do a character study from time to time. But go back with me, dude. Genesis chapter 11. I want to look at Lot's life and how he grew up. And can I say this as you're turning back? Before we criticize somebody, before we jump on somebody, let's look and see how they were raised. Let's, let's go back and see why they struggled. Boy, it's so easy. And I'm telling you, I struggle here. It's so easy for me to look at just the immediate and make my own conclusion about somebody. But when you look back and you go back to their life and you see Lot and you see what he dealt with as a young man, what he went through as a young person, it makes it totally different. It gives us compassion on people when they've struggled or they've been through life in, in the past that was not normal. In life they struggled with or had difficulty or had abuse or whatever it is in the past. I don't know what it is, but everybody has a story. Everybody has a past and... I find Lot has a past. And when I did a study on Lot's life, my mind changed about him. Because I understand some things. Notice with me in verse number 23 of Genesis chapter 11. The Bible says a man by the name of Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahar, and Haran. Now those three boys have got a daddy named Terah. And those three boys, Abraham, which will become Abraham, and Nahar, and Haran. So there's three boys out of the loins of Terah. He said, what's so important about that? Let's read on just a little bit. Now, these are the generations of Teran. Teran begat Abram, Nahar, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. Now, stop that just for a minute. Now, keep in mind, Lot is the son of Haran. What's the big deal about that? Read with me here. Let's look at Lot's life just for a minute. The Bible says, notice this expression, And Haran died before his father Teran, in the land of the nativity, the, in the earth of the child Chaldeans. You know what I just read? I read that, uh, that Lot lost his daddy at an early age. I read there just then that, that Lot grew up without a daddy. 
And I don't know about you, and I don't know how that makes you feel. I don't know if you grew up without a daddy. I don't know if you grew up without a parent. But in my heart, I, I, I read that, and all of a sudden my heart changes for Lot. Because now he doesn't have the godly influence, or he doesn't have the fatherly influence that he should have, or in a normal situation he could have. And when I begin to look at Lot, and I begin to look at Lot's life, and we'll see that in just a minute as we proceed further, but when I look at Lot, I all of a sudden now see that he grew up without a daddy. He grew up without a parent in the home. He grew up, uh, and it was no, uh, no uh, activity of his own. It was no decision of his own. God took his daddy. God allowed his daddy to die at a premature death. And I don't understand that. I don't, I don't understand all the order of death. And I read the book of Job in chapter 10 and verse 22. The Bible says, The shadow of death is without any order. I read that verse and I understand that death does not come in order. You know, it's not normal to bear your children. It's not normal to bear, their, bear those that are before your parents. It's not, it's not normal to do that. But here Lot had to struggle. And I don't know exactly how old he was. I don't know exactly his age, but I know he's a young man. He's so young that his uh, other family members take him in as their own. We'll see here in just a little bit. But we see Haran died. And that left Lot without a daddy. And when I read and understand Lot's life, you know, it encourages me to know that the valleys of our life we go through are not isolated only to us. You say it encourages you that his daddy died? No, it doesn't encourage me that his daddy died. It just encourages me that God is not selective in who that happens to. When I look at life and I look at people and they lose their family members and they lose their children and they lose their parents and all this is out of order and it all seems unfair and it seems unnecessary and all these things come into play and children grow up without this parent and children grow up without that parent and, and, and some of it of their own doing, of course, to dads, but yet the children have to suffer for it. And when I read, read Lot's life, I think, man, my heart begins to change for Lot. Lot lost his fatherly influence in his life. Lot lost that, that vital, vital area in his life. And I think about families. I think about my own family. I think about my nephew who lost his dad when he was 13. I think about my mother losing her mother when she was 13. My mother still talks about her mother just as she was living yesterday. And she died when my mother was 13. My mother grew up without a mother. I think about my, my own dear wife that never knew her mother really except when she's four, lost her mother. And that's all out of order. And that doesn't seem normal and that doesn't seem right. But can I tell you, God's still got a plan. Yeah. God's still on the throne. And we don't understand some things. And we don't understand why things happen. But God is still on the throne. And God's still in control. And God still has a great big plan. And He knows everything that's right and true. Yeah. We don't understand this, but I find God... He's got troubles. And we'll see that in just a minute. His troubles come from his childhood. James Dobson also said 34% of all children that grow up without both biological, without biological parents, 34 children will grow up. Only 30, excuse me, only 34% of children will grow up with both biological parents. That's staggering, isn't it? That means 70%, if that'd be true, 70% of our nation is growing up with a single parent. He also said children without fatherly influence are twi twice likely to drop out of school, go to jail, live with emotional behavior struggles, and live in anti -social, with antisocial problems. God intended for uh, children to have a mama and a daddy. God intended children to grow up with that fatherly influence and that motherly influence. There's a combination there that nothing in the world can take over. But Lot didn't have that until the Bible says, notice verse 31, and Tiran took Abraham, Abram, his son, and Lot. So he was raised by his grandfather. Lot was raised by his grandfather. And I want to just insert something in here. I'm sorry, but grandfather, and you, most of you will know it. I've heard that another expression. I wish I had my grandchildren first. <laughs> but Lot grew up with a grandparent, and I'm not against that, and that has to be a situation that's, that's important, and I understand all that. But in reality, and truthfully, God never intended a child to be raised by his grandparents. Right, right. 
God intended for the children to be raised by their mama and their daddy. Now, I understand, and I'm not... I'm not making accusations. I understand that you got to do what you got to do, but I'm just saying God intended for a child to be raised by his mama and his daddy. Grandparents are a lot less lenient. I tell you, my mother lets my children get by with stuff that she'd have murdered me on. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, st I'm stunned when I think of the things she lets them go get by with, and I'm thinking you would have murdered me if I'd have done that. Grandparents are wonderful. But we find here that Lot was raised by his grandfather. And then you'll go on to read that his grandfather dies. Now, now notice that. The Bible says in verse 31 that his grandfather took him in and he, and he, he raised him as his own. And the Bible says then Tiran died. So now you're dealing with a man. Lot's dealing with a situation. And we still don't know how young he is, but he's lost his dad. His grandfather has stepped in and, and bore the burden of bearing and raising him. Now his grandfather's died. Could you imagine? May God by His Spirit give us the understanding at this moment that we are an emotion. He's in an emotional wreck, no doubt. He's in emotional trouble here. He's, he's in trouble. That, that, let's just imagine he's a teenager. I don't even know how old he is, but let's just imagine for illustration's sake, he's just a teenager. Just imagine losing your dad and then uh, your grandfather coming along and then him dying. And that's when Abraham takes up. And the Bible says he brings him in and he takes Abraham. Notice chapter 12, verse number 1. And now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land where I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. You go on down and he talks about taking Lot with him. Get Lot and go with him. And then, then we get to the story. We see that in chapter 13, verse number 1. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him. So we find that Lot's with Abraham now. And so now we get to the story of chapter 13. We understand now that he's lost his dad. He's lost his grandfather. Now he's with Abraham. I, I think they get along fine. I think Abraham's a good influence, but no doubt he's his uncle. That's, April, that's Lot's uncle. He's going, with, he's going with his uncle. They begin to get blessed and begin to get herds and flocks and they begin to multiply their land and they begin to multiply their cattle and their herds and the Bible says strife becomes between them. Boy, is that not today? Is that not in our normal situation where families get strife between them over possessions? It's a sad day, but it's true. So the Bible says Lot made the initiative, or Abraham made the initiative. The Bible says he went to Lot and he says, choose what side you want to do. He says, the land's big. We don't need to fight over this. There's no strife between us. Don't let strife become your herdman and my herdman. Let's make a division. Here's the trouble. Here's what I want to show you. The Bible says in verse number 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. <laughs> It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. So here's Lot. He struggled all of his life, probably. I could imagine if I did, if I lost my dad and I lost my grandfather and I lost those that loved me and cared for me. Here he is standing, and he's got to make a decision. Can I stop right here and say this? Children that are left to themselves to make their own choices usually choose destruction. Yeah. I began studying this. And Dad, you listen to me. I'm going to show you from the Word of God. If we're so foolish as dads to let our children as their young age is coming up, if we're so foolish as dads to not help them make decisions will destroy our children. Yeah. This foolish idea that we say, oh, they're just let them do whatever they want to do. Well, let's make them their own decision. That's foolishness. That's foolishness for a man to stand back and say, son, just do whatever you want to do. No control, no uh, nothing. Just do whatever. That's foolishness. The Bible said a, man, a child left to himself will cause his mother to shame. I read multitude. I got so many verses that I just stopped, but I brought a few with us just so I know. I, I began to look up what we are to be as parents. Turn up a child the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart. Hear you children the instruction of a father and the tender no understanding. 
Hold fast of instructions. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. She shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly shall he go astray. For the commandment is a lamp, a law is a light, and reproves of instructions are the way of life. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scorned rebuke heareth not rebuke. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth the heir for the words of knowledge. Jeremiah 17, 23. Obey not, they obey not, neither incline their ear, but make their neck stick. Still, they may not hear nor receive instruction. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And dozens and dozens and dozens of more verses. Amen. And the second time, I won't read them all to you. But when I read Lot's wife and, the, and life and the choice he made, I can't help but go back that he lost that fatherly influence and somebody saying, don't go that way, Lot. This is wrong. That's right. He didn't have that fatherly influence to tell him or to instruct him or to help him. This is a choice you need to make. Yeah. Dear Dad, please do not give free reign to your children. Now you say, well, they got to learn to stand on their own two feet. Yes, well, let's hold their hand while they're standing. Amen. Amen. Let's, it's foolishness to open the gate and say, there you go, you're 14 years old, you do anything you want to do. It's foolishness. Right. It's foolishness. Lot was making a decision, and I'm compelled to believe that this decision he's about to make without some guidance, without some discernment, he's about to make a decision that will last his entire life. Yeah. How many young people, how many young people are living a life of consequences now because of the choices they made with no supervision? True. Yeah. Sure. Lot is a perfect example that we find in a man that's about to make a decision that's about to change his whole entire life. Why? Because he didn't have no supervision. He didn't have a daddy. He didn't have somebody standing in the shadows going, So that's a snare. That, that's, that, they ought not do that. You know, we ought to call out some things that's wrong. We ought to draw attention to some things that are wrong uh, to our children. We ought to draw attention. That's wicked. That's vile. That's, that's against God. You ought not do that. Why? They need some instruction. Amen. Amen. Why do you think God made His parents? Not to be their friend, and I want to be my children's friend. But the truth is, I'm their parent before I'm their friend. I'm to say, no, that's wrong. No, that's sinful. That's against God. They need to stand up one of these days and say, my daddy stood for something. He allowed me to stand for something. We need some instruction. Amen. So men need to stand up and say, that's wrong, and that's against God. We got too many weak need and puny men in the world that won't stand up and say that's right and that's wrong. Amen. Amen. Want to be their buddy. Forget being their buddy. Be their parent. Amen. Lot needed somebody to stand up. He needed Abraham to stand him in the face and say, that's against God. You ought not do that. Where's the day in America when a man stood up and told his children right from wrong and said, you're going to make this decision. Why might make them mad? Fool me on that stuff. They're living in your home. Yeah. They're eating your groceries or under your light switch. Yeah, right. They're in my home. They're going to do what I say do. And according to God's word, I'm going to do all I can do for Him. Yeah. True. Spurgeon said, he told his mother, his mother said, Charlie, she said, you rebel against God, I'll stand before Him and testify against you readily. Yeah. I wonder how many parents can stand before God and say, I did that which is right, God. No, they're going to stand before God and say, I let them do what they want to do. Yeah, and it was to their own destruction. Yeah. How foolish. How foolish we're living in a society of men. How foolish for Christian men to refuse and to give all their authority over to their own children. Look, I'm not here to know your children. I'm just saying they don't have the maturity to make the decisions they need to make. That's right. That's right. It's foolishness to let a, a small child. I, it drives me nuts to hear people say, I'm going to let my children tell us when we go to church. You gotta be you gotta be lost your mind. Well, that's where they have fun. Don't worry about the Bible. Don't worry about what they preach. Don't worry about what they do. Just where they have fun. That's where my children want to go. Boy. Makes me mad thinking about it. Dad, I want to go over here to... Wow. I better move on. <laughs> Children control where they eat, what they do, what they watch, and where they go. Here, the children in control. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to do this because Johnny don't want to do that. For you, Johnny! Amen. I'm the parent! Yeah. We call our kids all the time. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm the dad. That's right. 
That's right. We're not going to do this. True. We're not going to act like that. We're not going to speak that way. We're not going to talk that way. That's why the world acts. That's right. That's why the world dresses. We're not going to act like that. We're not going to live like that. Well, they, they, might not, they might not like me. God didn't call me for them to like me. That's right. God called me to be their parent. That's right. Had a dear friend of mine saying he wanted to discipline his children because he's afraid he might hurt their feelings. I said, you're supposed to hurt their feelings. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to hurt. That's right. There's something connected from here to there. <laughs> and when you press it in the right way, boy, things happen. Amen. Amen. That's what we need. I'm not here for abuse, but I'm here for discipline. Amen. That's what's wrong with America. There's not True. the men that will rise up That's and right. make the choices. I like what Dr. Williams said. He said, if you don't have any standards in your life, take mine and you get your own. <laughs> That's what I want to tell my children. I don't know what's right. You just, you just trust me. You just do what I say do. We'll be all right. I know there comes a time he's got to stand on his own two feet. But look here. If we don't cultivate that, if we don't help them make choices and explain that to them. Now I'm ranting Ray, but listen. I read a quote one time and said, children do not understand what we as a grown-up or adults understand. That's right. Hello? And God says, as a parent, we're to help our children make choices until they can come to the place in their maturity, their discernment, to make their own choices, which is right. Yeah. We told our son just the other day, we can't tell you forces of information because you don't have discernment. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you certain things because of decisions. We told him we went off, went off to camp. I said, buddy, here's the time. You make a bad decision, this will be the end of it. Here's the time. I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be checking. I'm going to make sure what you make, what choices you make. Why? Because those choices will determine other choices. Why? I want him to make right choices. And I want to direct him. I want to guide him by the help of God. Lot struggled here because he was about to make a choice. The Bible says he lifted up his eyes. You know what he made a choice on? He made a choice on something looking good. He made a choice on something feeling good. He made a choice on something. He didn't make a choice on principle. He didn't make a choice on righteousness. He just said, man, boy, look at all that water. Matthew Henry said he picked a good place to raise cattle, but a poor place to raise children. Mm -hmm. Exactly what he did. He looked off and said, man, look how beautiful that is. I got a good job down there. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dear man, Amen. You, you're going to take a job somewhere. You better hope there's a good church somewhere. That's right. Amen. This idea of you running after a dollar bill and saying, well, I can make a good promotion here and there's no church in 40 miles, you better be very careful. Amen. Amen. The choices you make are going to be very critical. The Bible says, tells us very plain, there's so many mistakes, parents, and I've made them too. But young people don't have the maturity to make those right decisions just yet. I, I, I should have done more study, and I wish to God that I knew how old Lot was right here. I, 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 and I don't know. I, let's say 16. There's not a man in the world that thinks right 16. <laughs> you know it's right, ain't it? And I'm not here to dog you if your son's 16. I'm just saying, how foolish were we when we were 16? Amen. I remember Levi told me was yesterday, he said, he remember the story about when I was 16 years old, I bought my first truck, I bought it when I was 15, I started driving when I was 16, and I burned the tires up. It was a 65 Chevrolet, man, that thing was fast. I could burn the tires up, but then would just laugh, he just laughed at that. And I remember, he said, all right, it's time to go buy the tires. I got in there, and we went to the tire store, and he said, 430 something dollars. I like to die. I hadn't had $400 in my whole life. But I'd saved up, I'd worked a summer job, I had a little bit of money, and I had every bit of that mess on those tires. Amen. And I remember it was pigs. We call it pigs and we got tires. But I pulled out a pig shop. And I pulled out, and then I'm just, you know, the little, the little rubber tips on top of the tires? I was easing that. He said, he said, let's spin these. I said, oh, no. Don't <laughs> <laughs> not spin these tires. <laughs> Why? He made me pay $434. And rightly so, by the way. Amen. Hey, this idea we put the bill, we pay everything, is a bunch of foolishness. Amen. That's what's wrong in America. We're not raising a working society. We're working a lazy society. Amen. Working a society that, that wants to give me everything and not work for it. Boy, so 
some of the greatest lessons I learned when I was 13, 14, 15. But if Lot's a young man making a decision, and all he sees is what he sees, and he can make a decision on what he sees, and not what he understands, and you want to tell children, don't do that, you're going to make a decision. I'm going to do it anyway. Poor decision. We see choices. I'll travel right on through this. We see the consequences. Run up with me to chapter 19. He's in that Sodom in Gomorrah. He's in an area. Do you know the Bible says he became a judge in that city? In verse number 1, And there came two angels that sat at Sodom, even, and Lot sat in the gate. Now that expression is very important. Because in Deuteronomy 21, you talk about the gate. That's the place of judgment. Lot was a man that made judgment. When people had problems in the city, he was like a city councilman or a, or a mayor or somebody that controlled the city. He went in and they would come to his gate to make judgment. This is wrong. This is right. Lot was sitting in the seat of the judgment of the city of Sodom. Don't you know he was politically corrupt? Don't you know he was morally corrupt? We see here just a little while why morally corrupt he was. But the decision he made back in the plains of Jordan was the consequences that we're reading about now. And the Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 2 that he was vexed in his soul with his seeing and his hearing. What he saw every day and what he heard every day. Can I tell you, man, if you're on a construction site somewhere or you're in a bank somewhere or you're in a job somewhere, what you hear and what you see will vex your righteous soul. Yeah. Yes, sir, it will. Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, the Bible says. Better be careful what you hear. Better be careful what you let in your ear gate. Better be careful what you let in your eye gate. That's very critical. But the Bible said he's sitting at the gate. He's sitting at the, at the place of judgment. And you know the story. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroys it. If it had been for God's mercy, he'd have died with him. But the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 19 and verse 17 that those angels came. And you'll read the story. It won't take time to do it. But they were so wicked. They were trying to have inappropriate relationships with the angels. With those angels. Filthy. And God said in 17, escape with thy life. Get out of there, Lot. And you'll read about he had an inappropriate relationship with his daughters. We won't take time to do it for the sake of the audience. But what do you think they learned that activity at? Living in that sinful city yeah. of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. With uncontrolled desires. Yeah. And no one telling them this is right, this is wrong. And there a lot was right along with him. Yeah. His choices, his consequences, and the third thing is, the conclusion, is that he lost his family. 19 verse 26. And he overthrew those cities, verse 25, and all of the plain and inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Solomon and Gomorrah was destroyed. He lost his wife. He didn't lose his two daughters, but he lost his wife. Due to the choices that he made way back. See, that's the thing about life that a lot of people miss, and I've missed it too. Life is like an ocean. Back here, the ocean tides come in. And it comes in a long time before it reaches the shore. When you're standing at the shore on the beach, you're feeling the results of something that happened long back in the ocean. That ocean went way back there and it's rippled and it's taken that long to come to the shore. That's exactly what happens with our life and choices. We make choices back here, way back here. We make a choice and we think nothing is ever going to come of it. It's not bad and it's not all that bad. But then all of a sudden, when the choices start having consequences and they start rolling in, then we look plus at God and say, I can't believe you let this happen. God said, you made that decision back there. Yeah. Back here when you made that choice. It's just coming to reality. Well, Lot is living in the reality of his choice he made back here. Amen. And what I learned from this story about Lot's life is, yes, he had troubles. And God had mercy on him. He had troubles. But he made some bad choices back here, and now he suffered the consequences in the future. He lost his family. I'm going to read 
read one verse to you. Luke chapter 17. We live our lives like there's no consequences, don't we? Luke 17, verse 32. And in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and is stuck, I love that expression, is stuck in the house. Let him not come down to take it away. God doesn't want your stuff. That's the whole message in itself. Lord, just stop there and preach a while. He's stuck. Yeah. Men get a lot of stuff, don't we? Yeah. We trade, we trade our children for stuff. Yeah. We trade our children for a thousand things, but it's just stuff. The Bible says don't even fool with that stuff. He says, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Then he makes this statement, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I'll tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, the other shall be left. And on it goes. Lot made a choice. There's choices, there's consequences. And the conclusion is, he lost his family. And I don't know a sadder statement to be on the tomb of a man. A statement that lost his family. I love to read about great men. I love to read about Charles Finney and R.A. Torrey. Yeah. I love to read about those great men, but I found some things in their lives that I'm going to try to learn from. They served God and they won thousands to Christ, but some of those men lost their own children. Yeah. Let me tell you something. There's not a thing in this world that's worth your children. I'm going to tell you something. I love this church. I love passion this church. But this church does not replace my children. That's right. Yeah. I wouldn't give my children for 10,000 of these churches. Yeah. I wouldn't give my children for 10,000 of the things that I do for God in this city. God never called any man, God never called any person to put to sacrifice his children. Or anything from it. Amen. God never asked for that. That's right. Lot lost his wife, lost his family because of the choices he made. If I could, if I could just nail one thing just a little bit harder. Just one more. It's the choices you make and the choices I make will affect more than just our children. Yeah. You're going to read Moab. He literally uh, children that was offsprings of his, his own daughters. Wicked foolishness. 